What's up? Come on in here. Welcome, welcome. I see some familiar faces in here. Yes, thank y'all for joining me today. Uh, I appreciate y'all being here today. Um, before we start, let's all just like ground ourselves in a collective breath. So plant your feet on the ground uh, and let's take a deep breath together. On my count of three, two, one. All right, let's jump into it. So I'm Delon Burnside, as you may or may not know. Uh, I've been planning this live event um, for about a month. Uh, and originally this was gonna be a celebratory pride event while we're all at home. I uh, had about 10 guests lined up and then we witnessed the, uh, the murders of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, uh, Tony McDade and the violence against Ayanna Dior in Minneapolis. And I knew I couldn't continue with the original celebratory plan. So we shifted the format um, and arrived at having this conversation series throughout Pride Month to reflect on the pressing issues of our time and the needs of our community. Um, I've been inspired by the folks that I met uh, during filming the Pride Land PBS documentary special and digital series that I recently hosted. Um, they, all LGBTQ people and allies living in the Deep South, have committed to changing the places that they call home. We have to do the same thing for our country. I encourage you to, to tune in uh, tomorrow and meet some of those incredible folks. Uh, if you have the time and space for it, it airs on PBS tomorrow at 9, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So my goal for these conversations here today and every Thursday during Pride Month are as follows. To collectively reimagine our definition understanding and celebration of pride to address how we all need to do better i think there's obviously a lot of work that needs to be done across this nation and world black lives matter white people need to do better the queer community needs to do better in its handling of black and trans issues and the black community needs to do better in its handling of queer and trans issues in order for us to bring an end to white supremacy, patriarchy, and its offspring of homophobia and transphobia. And finally, uh, I, we're here to highlight organizations whose work you can support and offer you resources that may help guide all of us through our collective healing and liberation. Um, and so, two resources that have really helped me. Uh, I don't know if they'll be helpful to you, but I wanna offer them up because they've been helpful to me during this time are a book called Unapologetic, written by Charlene Carruthers, who identifies as a black queer woman. Uh, she's a found, uh, one of the founding members of the BYP 100 uh, organization. Um, and Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. It's all about vulnerability. Um, so yeah, uh, without further ado, Let's hop into our first guest who I'm so excited is able to join us today. Uh, we met during filming Pride Land and uh, he is the mayor of It, it uh it's been a minute since i saw you in january in january i could shake your hand and and 
give you a bro hug. We can't do a lot of that stuff right now. <laughs> Everything has changed, right? It's upside down now. It's upside down. Uh, I'm glad to see you, though. It's a crazy time to, to, to be a leader in our country. And I know you must be incredibly busy. So thank you again for taking the time out to speak with me. Yeah. Um, there's a lot going on, OK? It, it, it's Pride Month. Um, we're in the midst of a global pandemic. And, and there's an uprising taking place that reverber is reverberating all around the globe. Um, in response to police brutality and the ways in which white supremacy plagues our nation. Um, as the mayor of an American city in this climate, how do you prioritize and address all of the needs, uh, the pressing needs of your people? And, and how is Montgomery doing right now? Well, you know, we're trying to prioritize the health over everything right now. And that's really our, our biggest objective uh, is to make sure that we let the, the data drive us into uh, our practices and things that are going to be best for everyone in this community. Unfortunately, even with that, we're having some challenges uh, stopping the spread of the COVID-19 virus. And that has presented uh, tremendous challenges, in particular for the uh, Black community here, because we have many underlying uh, health conditions and we're more susceptible and we're disproportionately represented uh, by those that have tested positive for COVID-19. And so while we're seeing a lot of you know, positive stories of people recovering, we're also seeing a lot of stories of people not recovering and people being ill and people really uh, impacting uh, themselves and people that they love and people that they work with. So we're trying to encourage everyone to stay at home as often as they can to certainly uh, wear a mask when out in public and to abide by those social distancing guidelines and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And with that, uh, those are things that we hope will kind of allow us to get out of this uh, chasm that we're in right now. But the numbers just don't uh, say that. The numbers really speak right. to what I've been talking about for a minute. And that is, I think we opened up too soon people relaxed and thought that the COVID-19 battle was over and that we could all get back to doing things the way we were prior to March. And that's just not the case. And so we've seen a surge in those cases and we've seen a surge, unfortunately, not only those infected, but those that have died from it as well. So with, with all of that going on and, and this sort of pandemic that we're seeing uh, against Black people as well, how are you all dealing with that in the face of COVID-19? I think that COVID-19 took a back seat in the, in the wake of the, the murder of George Floyd and, and others. I think, you know, everyone kind of uh, pushed that, you know, whether right or wrong to the back of their radar because there was such a sense of anger, frustration, and rage at our system that people wanted to protest. People wanted to voice their their frustration and their concerns, and we had to make it a point to hear them and meet them where they were. And so uh, the aspect of COVID-19 has been now probably brought back to the forefront since some of the protests have, have slowed, and we've started to have some conversations with community activists and leaders. But really what we've been trying to also kind of balance with that has been what is our role as policymakers to respond to those who protested peacefully and purposefully, and how can we implement better practices in relation to our police and our community? And so we're really trying to look at every way that we can from adopting the A Can't Wait campaign and joining that to looking and reviewing a citizens review board and one that will have some teeth and will have the confidence of the people of this community. And we're having other conversations about reforms that we can make also. So we're trying to balance the two simultaneously. So there are, uh, there are folks who are critical of the A Can't Wait campaign, and there are folks who are saying that what, what we really need is to defund the police. Uh, where do you stand on that? I mean, I, I, you know, there's this argument between reform versus completely breaking down and, and creating a new system that actually uh, stops investing in police and starts investing in, in communities, especially black and brown communities who are disproportionately affected by police violence. How do you, what do you what changes do you personally see that need to be made across this country to make to make it more equitable so that we can actually see justice played out in reality and not just on paper? 
Well, I think that people uh, sometimes fall into the trap of, of, of a neither nor of a neither or scenario, and, and I don't believe in uh, that you can either have one thing or the other. I think that you can have both. I think that we need policemen and women who do their jobs, who are guardians of our community, who understand that they work for the community, not for the police chief, not for myself as a mayor, but not for anyone else other than the people. I think that we can also have a, a certainly a argument about how we reinvest in our community, how we reinvest in social service programs, things that I tried to do when I was probate judge regarding mental health and other services like that. So we have to get back into those community-based programs. We have to get back into programs that allow us to um, not talk and walk uh, with our police department to get to know those communities because our communities want to be safe, uh, but they don't want to be afraid of the police. And so I think that we have to really understand the history of our individual communities and the police and community interaction and then look at ways that we can change that. And I think there are a number of things we can do without playing a, a, a zero-sum strategy of you either have to have one or you don't have the other. Gotcha. Uh, I I'm still sort of educating myself on, on all of the ins and outs of, of, of what all of these calls to action mean. Uh, and I think my sort of understanding of the, the defunding is not necessarily to not have some sort of policing structure, but to allow the community, as you're saying, allow the community to, to be the priority um, and allow them to sort of lead what safety looks like in their neighborhoods. Um, Montgomery has a rich history of, of protest and, and demonstrations. Um, when we met during the filming of Pride Land, uh, you briefly mentioned that your father um, had been arrested for protesting alongside Dr. King. Uh, what do you think he makes of all of this? And uh, what has he sort of taught you about progress and the movement towards liberation? Well, you know, his feedback to me has been, this is part of it, right? That uh, freedom, justice, and equality have all come about through movements. They've all been a continuous part of making this country live up to its ideals. And it ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. And that nothing happens overnight. And that we have to be committed to our goals and objectives, understanding that we have to set those and make sure that we negotiate not just from the position of protest, but also from the position of policy. Because when the protests fade, ultimately you want to make sure that uh, the impact of those protests are felt years and decades after that. And, you know, from someone who helped integrate the lunch counters as a student like he did in 1960, uh, you know, what he sees is what you've always uh, read about in that youthful rebellion and that youthful rebellion pushing this country and pushing other leaders to go farther and faster than maybe they thought they could at the moment. And so he's pleased with what's happened. He's even more pleased, I think, by the peaceful, uh, purposeful protests, not so much by those that uh, took advantage of that, but, you know, in, in his mind as someone who's been a part of protests for decades, he understands that sometimes, you know, people kind of get outside of whatever may be planned or whatever may be ideal because they want to be heard. They want to make sure they are seen and you understand the pain and the, and the really the trauma that they're dealing with. And so we've had a number of conversations over the last couple of weeks and we continue to kind of have those because it guides my approach to how I deal not only with protests, but how I deal with policy. And so speaking about policy, people have an eagerness <clears throat> to be involved right now. Uh, what should people know about how their local governments work? And uh, what can they do to, to affect change in their local governments and have their voices heard? Uh, does calling and tweeting your elected officials actually work or make a difference? Uh, what sort of advice do you have for folks who, who are making these types of calls and who want to get involved? That's a great question. I, I like to say that, you know, the government closest to you is the one that impacts you the most. And so while we would you say that one more time, would you say that one more time for those listening? Sure. The, the government that's closest to you is the government that impacts you by far the most. And so while we focus on the, the national uh, political scene, the president, we focus on um, those in Congress, 
often the things that you're going to feel the most of are those ordinances and those laws that are enacted at the local and state level. And so what I would encourage anyone who really wants to see that policy uh, impacted and implemented is to get involved. And I know now, you know, a lot of communities aren't having in-person meetings, but you can still participate virtually. You can still make sure you get a petition uh, that goes before your county or city council or commission that goes before your state legislators about what you want to see, what ordinances you want to be prioritized, and what type of reform you want to see implemented. Because the thing about local government is often it's a lot easier to change things at the local level than it is at the national level because you are closer to those decision makers and they are closer to the people who vote for or against them. And so, you know, some of the protests now can be changed and can be uh, transferred to a movement locally. It can be transferred to a movement at the state level to make sure those who represent you, whether that's in the criminal justice system, whether that's those who are making uh, some of the education policies, or even those who are impacting our economic decisions and policies, understand what all of this means, that they understand what role they can play. And so I would not try to fix everything at one time. You want to have maybe three to five areas that you want to see done, maybe within 90 days. That's certainly realistic, I think, in most cities and, and locales. Maybe at the state level it may be challenging, depending if your legislature is in session or not. But look that up, because that's where a lot of the movement has gone now, because Congress, with us having a Republican-led Senate and a Democratic-led House, a lot of bills get stalled. So you hear the headlines or you hear the ideas, but you see very few passages of bills. Where the bills and the laws are now being passed is at the state level, state by state, and then being implemented at the local level, community by community. And those are things that I think any activist, any protester who wants to see things get done should do, even if that includes my city, Montgomery, Alabama. Bring it here, bring us the ideas, and make sure that we know exactly what your priorities are so we can be held accountable. And that's Amen. how all elected officials should be. And that is you've got to hold them accountable to those things that you want to see them do or else they may not get done. Thank you, Mayor Reed. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I know you're a busy man. Uh, sending my, my prayers out to you guys and all of my energy in Montgomery as you battle COVID-19. Uh, and, and, and lots of love to you and the family. It's good to see you again, man, and I hope, to, I hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Look forward to checking everything out, too. I hope you make me look good. Yes, tomorrow y'all will see more of this uh, man on Pride Land, PBS, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I interview him. We have a great time. So thanks, Mary. I'll talk to you soon. All right, look forward to that. Thanks so much. Later. Be blessed. So y'all heard it. Y'all heard it from the man himself, Mayor Stephen Reed. Get involved. Get up. Stand up. Stand up for your rights. I don't know. Did we get rid of Mayor Reed? Stand up for your rights. Get up. Stand up. I think we got a... A technical difficulty. So we're going to rock it out until Mayor Reed leaves the screen. But our next guest is Alfonso David, president of the Human Rights Campaign. Uh, as Bob Marley said, get up, stand up, stand up for your rights. Stand up for your rights. My bad, y'all. We having a little technical difficulty. We're going to be back with the next guest in a second.
One second, y'all. I'm gonna let my tech team see what's happening on my screen. They can't see it. Uh. We're not gonna let the devil stop us. The devil is a lie. Get up, stand up. All right, we back. Stand up for your right. Get up, stand up. Stand up for your right. Get up, stand up. Stand up we back. For your right. And we back. Get Just up, like nothing ever up. happened. We Don't back up next with right. Alfonso David of the Human Rights Campaign coming up next. All right, we have Alfonso David.
having technical issues, but you know <laughs> what? Bob Marley and the way the Whalers said no, we gonna get up and we gonna stand up for our rights. <laughs> you know? <laughs> They're not gonna take our joy today. We back though. We are back. They cannot shut us down. <laughs> They're trying to shut us down, but they can't. Thank you for joining us, my friend. How are you? You're welcome. I am, you know, the knee-jerk reaction is to say I'm good. Um, but every day is a struggle. Every day is a challenge going through what we're all going through. Um, but I'm okay. Good. I'm, I'm, okay. Glad to, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, it's good to see your face. Um, so we lost some time, so let's just jump right in. Okay. Uh, part of what we're trying to do is, 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 is sort of take this moment to, to gather around what pride means. And so my question for you is, what does pride mean to you in this moment in history? Well, pride for me means protest. Pride for me means liberation. Pride for me means equality. We have to remember, and many people do, but not all of us, have to remember that pride started with protest. Compton's Cafeteria, Black Cat, Stonewall, all started by Black and Latinx transgender members of our community. We have pride today because of Black and Latinx transgender members of our community. We should understand that, we should accept it, and we should respect it. And that's what this pride and all pride should really mean to us. Looking back at our history, respecting our history, and allowing our history to show us a path to the future. And for me, pride means protest. Pride means the quest for liberation. Pride means the quest for equality. We are not there yet. And when you're talking about people of color who are also queer, we've been fighting for more than 400 years to be mm -hmm. recognized and be shown dignity that we are all deserving of. And we haven't gotten to that place. The Constitution says what it says, but we know is interpreted in very different ways, depending on who you are. So as we think about this pride, yes, we're all, we're not able to get on the streets and sort of in the parades and the floats, but take a step back, use this opportunity to take a step back and really read up about Compton's Cafeteria, Black Cat, Stonewall, and many others that help start a movement, a movement for equality. And that's what this pride should mean for all of us as we go through this really difficult time, but also very inspiring time. Absolutely. It's, com it's completely inspiring. We, we are in a moment that, um, that as I think Billy, Billy Porter, who's going to be on here joining me later, as he called it a tipping point, where I feel like, you know, we, we're at the precipice of, of, this, of change. You know, at least that's my hope. Um, you know, I, I recently uh, rewatched the Marsha P. Johnson documentary, um, uh, uh, The Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson. Um, and one of the most uh, memorable um, and emotional and disturbing moments of the whole thing is the moment where Sylvia Rivera is on stage at a Pride event and is trying to speak to a crowd of what is mostly white gays and she's being booed off of the stage and they don't want to hear anything that she has to say um hrc it, it, so one of my goals with this conversation too is to is to really challenge us all to to look at ourselves myself included and figure out how we can be and do better hrc has come under fire in the past uh for being an organization that's primarily concerned with um the, the the rights of white gay men uh mm -hmm. and, and in recent efforts to sort of stand with trans women has come under fire from some some so, some trans folks that uh who've been on the ground for years that that perhaps hrc should allow those groups that have been on the ground doing the work for years to do that work do you think there's any validity to those claims uh, and how are you working to address and rectify some of the issues that you inherited when you became the president of the Human Rights Campaign? Thank you for that. Um, well, first, I don't want to invalidate how people feel. I think how they feel is how they feel, and they should be allowed to feel how they feel. 
Having said that, our history, although we should learn from it, should not define us. I took over this organization as the first person of color. And if we allow our history to define our future, we would never have Barack Obama. He was the first person of color to serve as the president of the United States. And if we said, well, this country is historically racist, we've never had a person of color, then we would never have Barack Obama. We would never have many of the firsts that we have. And so although our history is riddled with bigotry, including many institutions and organizations, HRC is no different. But if we're going to create a path to a future, a future that is inclusive, we have to allow that future to be created. And so, yes, uh, many HR, uh, LGBTQ organizations were not inclusive of trans members of our community for a very long time. There was a debate about adding the T. I don't know, well, I don't know, I'm not gonna talk about your age right now, Delon, but there was a debate <laughs> about adding the T, which in this day and age is offensive and back then was offensive as well. And mm. we, had to, we have to get to a point where we can see our history for what it is, have it inform our thinking, but also help us chart a, a, a path to the future. And so I am deeply proud to have taken over this organization um, because I, I, this is a part of my movement. I can't say because one organization or two organizations did something bad in the past that I'm going to then give over my participation in this movement to others that defined it to exclude me. Quite the contrary, I have a very different philosophy we are agents of change, and we have to participate in the change that we want to see. We can't allow others to define that change. We have to be the agents of it. And so, yes, it's the past, but it's not my future, and it certainly is not my present. So what, how would you define the, the role of the HRC uh, in, the, in, the liberate, in the present day liberation movement? How, since, since we're not, it's not your past, you have to get away from the past, and it's not your present, what does the future look like, my brother? How do you, what, what's the role that, that you want to play uh, to be an agent of change in this moment? It, and, and I don't want to call it a moment because this is, we have to think of this as mo being more than just a moment, you know? So in this movement for collective liberation, you guys are called the Human Rights Campaign. And to me, that sort of implies not just being about LGBTQ folks and and I and I and I say that as a queer person because I think that the the liberation of trans people specifically uh, we're all tied to their liberation and their them being seen as total human beings. What do you think? As the last question, what do you think is the role of HRC in this present day liberation movement? Well, as you know, the Human Rights Campaign is the largest LGBTQ civil rights organization in the world. So we have more than 3.3 million members. In this election, we're going to define, hopefully define the trajectory of the future. We have mm -hmm. access to 57 million pro-equality voters. And in the priority states, Arizona, Michigan, Nevada, Ohio, Texas, um, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. I thought I was gonna miss one. But we have 10 million pro-equality voters. Those are people that vote to support LGBTQ issues and equality issues. We have an opportunity to actually create a path forward for us, marginalized communities. And HRC is going to serve as a key agent in trying to drive, drive that change. But more importantly, it's not going to be about one election. We cannot win one election and lose the next. We have to think about how we can see beyond ourselves, which gets me back to the original point about our history. If we can see beyond ourselves, we are going to achieve liberation. We're going to achieve equality. What we often do is we fight for policy issues that only affect us. We fight for issues that only affect us. And if we can see beyond ourselves, if we can see ourselves in the Latinx immigrant or see ourselves in the person who is HIV positive, living in the South, having no access to health care, if we can see ourselves in the black transgender woman who is walking home at night or free to walk home at night because she might face violence, that's how we affect change. 
We have to be invested in each other's liberation and equality. And that is the role. As I stand here as the president of, of the Human Rights Campaign, I want the organization to serve in because that is the movement. That is the future of the movement. And, in, and from my perspective, that is how we get to liberation. Thank you, my friend. It's so oh, great welcome. to see you. I love you, man. Be safe. Be well. Take care of yourself. And, uh, and we'll talk more soon. You too. I love you too. Take care. Later. All right. That worked. We were able to get rid of Alfonso, although I love him. We were able to get rid of him for a moment. Uh, and I also love this next man that's about to come up. And this is his song, for what it's worth. Billy Porter, the Billy Porter. William Ellis Porter is coming up next. Hey. I love this remake. It's so good. Alfonso's really great, and I think he's right. We have to begin to see beyond ourselves. It's not just about thinking about the, the, the queers or just thinking about the black people. It's, it's about how do we all become free. Nobody's free until we all free, y'all. Hey. We're going to get Billy Porter in here. Talk to him for a minute. Listen, we got to vote. We got to vote. Absolutely. <laughs> we got to do more than vote, but we, but we got to vote, too. Yes. Um, how are you? I'm all right. I see you're baldish. You're giving us bald, grown yeah. man with a beard and a... Like, I can't even grow that beard. Can I tell you a secret? Yes, baby. Okay, so I've been battling alopecia for, like the last year and a half. Okay. And I've been dealing with it with my dermatologist and it started to get worse during the pandemic. I don't know if it's just the stress of it all. Yeah. But it just started to get worse and it was stressing me out even more. So I just, one day I got up and just shaved it off. So what do you mean by alopecia on your head? Is it patches or it's it turns, patches. It it's turns patches. white? No, it just the hair falls out. Falls out. Yeah. Hold on one second. Let me put you on my um, headphones so I can hear you. We've got uh, Billy did something. We lost him for a second. There he is. No, I can hear you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but you know, I like it. I'm digging it for now. We'll see. I got to grow it back in time for us to, to get back to filming, but who knows when that'll be. Yeah. Who knows when that is? So just keep your <laughs> alopecia to yourself, honey. You can just keep that head as bald as you want. Yes. Um, okay. So obviously we're here to talk about a few things, what's going on in our world today. Um, and, 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 and it's Pride Month. Um, and uh, you posted a video the other day um, that w was really striking. And uh, I'm, I'm sure, you know, it probably rubbed some people the wrong way. Uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you said, and I quote, as a Black queer man in America, 
my basic human rights have been up for legislation every single day that I have had breath in my body from all sides. You went on to say the black community's relationship with the LGBTQ plus community is eerily similar to white supremacists. Black folks, you cannot expect our demands of equality to be met with any real legislative policy and change when you turn around and inflict the same on us. This thing that you are talking about, where do you think that stems from in the black community? Homophobia. Weaponizing the Bible to justify hate, period. I will not stay silent anymore. And while I don't adjudicate my life and my morals and my point of view in sound bites on social media, I will say this because I'm going to address this in a larger, in a larger way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we must start treating each other right. Period. Yeah. What I did was created a, was create a um, do unto others analogy. That's simply what it is. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I'm a black man first. The end. Yeah. I'm a black man first. Yeah. Do you, then, yeah. Do you think that I, because I, a couple of people, when they knew I was talking to you about it, they called me and I'm like, listen, I, I agree with what Billy said. I, I may not agree with, how he said it, but I agree with what he said. And I think that perhaps the nuance that was missing out of that soundbite that people took out of context is the nuance of understanding that the homophobia that you speak about, the weaponizing of the Bible is, is also a part of the colonialization of Black folks. Correct. And I think, I think that that is what makes it different. That's why, yeah. it's, why you can't call it the same as white supremacy. Because it's not the same. That's not what I'm saying. Right, right. I I'm aware. drew a comparison between right. a do, do unto others comparison and everybody who reads that and everybody who saw it understands exactly what that is. Don't come at me with mess. Yeah. Do not come at me with mess. Y'all know I'm not saying it's the same thing. Right. You know I'm not. I'm drawing the parallels in behavior. Period. The end. Yep. It's a parallel in behavior. They use the Bible to justify slavery. Homophobia on all ends. I'm not talking about just black people. Right. On all ends is justified through that same book. What are we going to do with it? Yep. How are we going to deal with this? Yep. I will never be silent again. And you shouldn't be. I will never be silent again. And everybody can have whatever their version of that story is, whatever they want to call me, whatever it is. I've heard it all. I've seen it all. It's been my entire life. I'm not surprised. Right. It's no surprise. Yeah. You're not listening. You want to be heard. We want to be heard. We have to listen as well, even when it's uncomfortable. Black trans women are being killed at the hands of black cis men all the time. And the only reason why I understand this for myself, you know, as a 50 year old gay man, is that I lived in a space where the T in LGBTQ was largely absent. Mm -hmm. I didn't know myself. Mm -hmm. I had no idea it was like that. Yeah. You know, until we started working on Pose and mm -hmm. working with these ladies, yeah. you know, and like feeling their trauma every day as they, as we have to pretend through telling the story 
what they live. But they're still, they're living it in real time. The day we filmed Candy's funeral, there was yet another girl killed at the hands I of remember. cisgendered black men. The day we filmed her funeral, those girls in yeah. that space were fully broken, traumatized, and broke. Like, I, yeah. and I couldn't do a thing. So, if anybody thinks yeah. that I'm going to sit here and be silent through this, see, and I wasn't supposed to talk about this with you. I was going to tell. I was not going to talk about this with you because I don't like doing it online. But because it's with you, I'm doing it because. We have to see it. We have, we have to. to get our houses in order. We do. And, I, and, and the reason why I wanted to talk about it with you, Billy, is because I went to a protest here in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, and there was a certain, uh, a certain city council person who was sponsoring the event. And, and I, so I went. And I went. My friend was there. My mom and I, we went. And we were going to support, do the thing. Um, but I was so disappointed and enraged by the lack of intersectionality in that space yeah from the from the podium uh, this was just days after ayana dior had been beaten brutally by a group of trans uh, a group of cisgender people uh and and people just watching this was black on the, people black people on the heels of brianna taylor being murdered brianna taylor's name wasn't mentioned uh ayana dior's name was not mentioned um, Tony McDade's name was not mentioned. The names that were being called out were cisgendered men. And I, I was frustrated because this is a, a person who represents queer and black communities as a, as, as a council member. And mm -hmm. I had to challenge this person. I had to say to them, this is not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. It, it's because y'all okay. did that before. Yes. His name is Bayard Rustin. Y'all yes. did that before. The last time when this shit didn't stick, y'all did it already. We took the back seat. We were silenced for the betterment of the cause. That already happened. That happened already. Yeah. We are all together. We have we to be. We are all together, period. That's the only way that this is going to work, and that's all, all I'm saying. Yeah. Look at that and investigate it because it's not working. You can't do that without consequences. You can't do that. Yeah, yeah. we have to be, we have to understand that our liberation is tied up with the trans women's liberation, just like white people's liberation is, is truly tied to the liberation of black trans women. It's all connected. None of us are free free until we're all free. None and of us are free not, until we're all free. And I will not be celebrating pride or anything else with, until all of us are free. There's no celebration yeah. until all of us are free. Correct. And um, we're moving in the right direction, I feel like. I feel like we're moving in the right direction. Just recently, in the last couple of, you know, in the last couple of weeks since George Floyd, George Floyd because um, what's different what feels different about this, and this is what I've been talking about for years, is that we have been in the wild, wild west concerning, in my opinion, concerning social media and reality television and how it has affected our culture and how we activate. Mm -hmm. Activism is not tweeting. Right. We are at a social media place. We can't go back. I understand that. But my question has been, how do we take what we've learned from the past, the tools that we've had from the past, and bring them into the present? How do we mobilize? How do we put our bodies on the line? Mm -hmm. Nothing changes until our bodies are on the line, until we're marching in the streets. That's how it works. It's unfortunate. It, I hate it. But that's you see what's happening. That, 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 but that's yeah, what the that's system how we, is. That's how we change the system. That's how we change it. 
We have to get out in the streets. And my concern, and what was depressing me the most for a really long time, was that I felt like our entire society had become desensitized mm -hmm. to the visual. But now they got to pay attention. They just ignored what? it last time. Yeah, but, but we, we have become desensitized to the visual. And so I was concerned that nothing visual would ignite anything, you know, because we see it all day, every day online. We see it on Twitter. We see it on Instagram. And we just see it and we see it and we see it. And I go back to the civil rights movement. I go back to the AIDS crisis. You know, how those people mobilized through media, how they use the media changed by the visual. And that was not happening, in my opinion, until George Floyd. Yeah. It reignited the power of the media. Yeah. It re reignited it in a way Absolutely. that created an outrage that then mobilized. Yeah. Not an outrage that stopped at Twitter. Yeah. But an outrage that has mobilized a nation as well as the world. Yeah. To demand sweeping reform. Yeah. On everything. So that we could see the change for good. The change for, for good, good. That, that you talk about in this song. Change for good. Change for good. We've seen change. We fought for it for years and years and decades and centuries. Yeah. And this motherfucker in three and a half years have rolled most of those things back. And what is what does change for good look like in your opinion? Change for good for me, in my opinion, is what the Constitution states, which is all men are created equal. Equality across the board, even for the people who we don't understand or like, they're still human beings. We all deserve equality. Yeah. Our basic human rights and a, and, and a level playing field so that we can all be successful. Yeah. You know, I am a part of the generation of people who had a government that still cared. You know, I entered the sixth grade the year that Reagan and trickle down economics and all of that stuff was introduced. So when I tell you, I had a plethora of institutions and spaces for me to practice my art, the free dance classes, the free music lessons, you know, the free stuff that was available to anyone who was talented enough. I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't have that stuff. And we're grateful for it. We're grateful and for I'm it. And I'm so, so grateful for it. We need to get back to that. We need to get back to reinvesting in our communities of, of color. Yeah, yeah. They, had, they were investing in us. And you were you able know? to cultivate that and, and, I was and able, become this. Yeah. I would not be here. I was born into poverty. I was born into, into lack and scarcity. Yeah. You know? My mother couldn't, my parents couldn't afford for me to go to these dance classes every day. <laughs> yeah. You know, and go to these music classes. I remember there was a program, a music program in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania called Centers for Musically Talented. It was every Saturday from 12 to five, five hours every Saturday. They took over the creative and performing arts high school. And you had, I had a private voice lesson. I have a private saxophone lesson. 
I had choir class. I had eurythmics class. I had um, solfege. I had sight singing. I had like. This is what's possible, ladies and gentlemen. Y'all are looking at Billy Porter, Tony, Grammy, Emmy award winning singer, actor. This is what's possible when when black kids have those experiences and those opportunities. When so get somebody to invests in us. Just invest in us. Yeah. Invest in our communities. Yeah. You know, defund the police is a sound bite. We are living in a sound bite world. Orangina 45 does so well because he knows how to manipulate a sound bite. Defund the police is a sound bite that gets everybody's attention. Now that we have your attention, what we're saying is invest in black communities. The six billion dollar budget that you have for the police, take one billion of that away. One billion of six to reinvest in our communities of color, to reinvest in how we train our police force, to demilitarize our police force. The police were created to catch slaves. That's yeah. the history of what the police is about. Demilitarize them. We're yeah. not saying that all police are bad. That's not, not what we're saying. But when we were trying to say it in a way that wasn't so offensive, yeah. nobody was listening. Yeah. It takes yeah. defund the police. It right. takes the offensive soundbite to get your fucking attention. Say that, Billy Porter. He just broke it down for y'all, plain and simple. Now y'all know what it's about. This is what we're fighting for when we say defund the police. I, I thank you so, so much for taking this time for me, my brother. You know I love you. You my, you my um, on-screen boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I got to let you go. But before we go, sing, okay. sing one little piece of, one little line. Just one line of, of, uh, uh, Pouring all your strikes deep yes. into your life. It will creep. Yes. <laughs> It starts when you're always afraid. You step out of line. The man come and take you away. We better Yes, stop. Billy Porter, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, honey. <laughs> Congratulations on your I love uh, you. I love you too. Congratulations on your special. I can't wait to see it. Thank you so much. All, All right, right, tomorrow, nine o'clock, Eastern Standard yes. Time. I love you. All right, we got Miss Janet Mock. Where is she? Janet Mock is in the building, y'all. She's next. Hey! Hey! How, okay, how am I gonna talk Billy Singing though? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to keep you waiting. You I was like, so I cannot. Great. I cannot hit a note. I cannot do anything. Wait, so. well, that's okay because I have this song that I wanted to dedicate to you in the transition time that he took up. So uh, uh, we had some technical difficulties earlier. So I'm going to play a little bit of this song. This is the song that I dedicate to Miss Janet Mock. If it plays for me. Where we at? All of my tech. No. Sing it. <laughs> oh my God. I can't sing it like Aretha though. Uh, I don't know what's going on. This thing is crazy. We gonna play it at some point when I get it back right. How are you? I'm, I'm good. Energized. I think that that's the positive um, adjective that I should use to describe this time. I think that seeing, you know, decades of organizing, um, come to fruition into the mainstream with people, you know, just hearing you all talk about defund the police, seeing that that now has transitioned to a soundbite, that before it was something that was so scary to so many people, and now it's becoming more mainstream. That is super energizing to hear people say and to do their education about, to realize that in all these different cities and counties that we have 
um, overabundance of resources dedicated to police forces, which are not frankly helping black and brown communities at all that consistently surveillance us, that have always surveillance queer and trans bodies. And so to see that finally we are paying attention to what's going on and where the money is going and saying that we're gonna need accountability and also investment in where we are and where our people live. And so that is energizing to me. So that's how I'm, I'm doing on this day. I feel that. I wish, I wish there was some way that I could like bring people that have been in this together today to bring them together. I had Mayor Stephen Reed from Montgomery on here today. Uh, and I was asking him about this because he, he mentioned the campaign for eight can't wait, which is a completely different sort of uh, idea about how we address police and, and so it's, it's police reform and instead of actually what what many in the Black Lives Matter movement are saying should be a, a movement for abolition of the police. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any thoughts and ideas about the um, just those two things uh, up against each other, those two ideas? I think it's all a part of, you know, abolition work. I think that our country's not there yet mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of abolition work. This is stuff that people have been talking about from the very beginning of the police force even being here. Um, I think if you look at and engage in, you know, Angela Davis's work um, from her incarceration all the way until today, she's been saying the same thing. I think that now we're finally at a point that we'll settle for defund the police. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I think yeah. that anything less than that, I think that the organizers on the ground have told us what they want. And I think that we take, you know, I take my lead from them. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, mm -hmm. as a creative, as an artist, my job, I think, is to use my platform as you are right now to amplify the work of those who are doing the movement, organizing work on the ground. And so for me, Defund the Police is where we're at. The people are there, and I think that that's what we should be pushing forward as this to the point where it's a soundbite that people are scared of hearing because they know that right. they need to be held accountable. So we need to hold our elected leaders accountable to that in the same way that um, Black Visions Collective has done in Minneapolis in that amazing way with their with their mayor screaming shame at him for not uh, committing. Absolutely, to it. yeah. It's so we, this is all happening in the middle of Pride Month, um, <laughs> and the global conversation is obviously. Uh, uh, let me redirect. I want to. I want to go to something. Something else. In chapter one of redefining Ooh, not the yes. text. <laughs> the text, baby. Let's get to. Let's just jump into the text. Get to the holy transcripture, honey. Here it you is. You know, because <laughs> Janet Mock writes, y'all. I mean, I, I know y'all have seen Pose, but this woman writes. Okay. Um, if you have not read Redefining Realness. Please read it. It's brilliant. Uh, and the audio book is great because you get to hear her read it to you. Um, oh <laughs> uh, but in chapter one, you say that the media taught you that being trans is not something that you should be proud of that, because trans women were depicted uh, as sort of punchlines and it was always showing um, images of pain, which I know is something that uh, you all have worked really hard to not be with Pose. Um, we also know that there's a strong legacy of black and brown women who, black and brown trans women who have fought for the rights that we actually enjoy today. So all of the things that were happening in the media were just like one thing and they weren't actually uplifting the voices of the women who were actually making change for us. How do you, how do you think seeing those negative images um, of trans folks, how do you think that impacted your psyche? And, and how do you think it impacts the world, the rest of the world's view on trans women? Well, you know, the power of the television um, to invite people into your home. And that's oftentimes the only time that you have an engagement with uh, people unlike yourself. Right. And so for me, I grew up learning to love and to center uh, a lot of white girls. <laughs> in my coming of age on Nickelodeon um, and any kind of teen, you know, show that I watched. And so in the same way, Black womanhood and Black trans womanhood was never kind of uplifted in that way. And I can even go more widely just to trans womanhood, period, uh, regardless of race. And so for me, I think growing up with that lack of representation was tough because I think on um, an unconscious level, it teaches you that who you are is wrong because you must be wrong if people don't want to see you. Um, 
or people don't want to represent you. I think on another level, I was very, very lucky um, to have a life that wasn't completely dedicated or dictated by what I saw on screen, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I had a native Hawaiian grandmother. I have a um, black, you know, grandmother from Louisiana who raised her children in Texas. And I had images of what womanhood looked like in front of me. I then, as I came to coming of age and knowing myself as trans, uh, my gender identity, I was able to meet, you know, trans women in Hawaii, um, like my best friend, Wendy, who showed me the way and said, sis, we got you. I know who you are. I know exactly what you want to be and who you're going to become. So let's do this thing together. And I think that's a lot of the stuff, a lot of that relationship and that kind of composite um, pieces of womanhood kind of have obviously a community, the power of operating, as Billy said a little bit earlier, out of a space of black to come to a place of abundance um, Mm -hmm. through community. And so for me, you know, I've been fed, um, I've been nurtured, I've been loved um, by women like Blanca, um, who have been so selfless to take to take in um, folk like me who are kind of lost little lambs um, and give them, you know, a greater sense of direction and put them on a path toward their own, to, toward liberating themselves. Yeah. And I think for me, that's what equality looks like. It's all of us being able to come into a space where we can liberate ourselves and live freely without the threat of violence or harassment or incarceration. See, you already answering another question that I have for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll just go right to, to that. Yeah, you, you talk about, in the book, there's a moment in the book where you, you talk about like the, the little girl that, were, that you were, you didn't have the opportunity to be free and play. Um, what, do you think, what do you think it's gonna take for the world to, to become that place where little Janets can be free to play? Oh God, it seems like such a simple question, right? Um, but it's just, you know, that a part of freedom is um, I think uh, Barbara Smith, you know, a long time black feminist, lesbian activist, organizer and writer. She says that the reason why she writes is to give us a pathway to better live and to better dream. And mm-hmm. I think that for me, what I mm-hmm. could you say want, that one more time? Would you mind saying that one more time? Yeah, is um, the reason why she writes is to give us a pathway to better live and to better dream. Mm-hmm. And so to me, I think, you know, just being able to live for Black people on just a basic level, just Blackness is already hard, right? We're talking mm-hmm. about, we're still fighting to come to a place where we're moving from survival to thriving, right? And a few of right. us have been able to thrive mm-hmm. and to live comfortably, to be able to support our families, support ourselves, to be able to have access to healthcare and education um, and political power, um, to get some kind of capital so that we can take care of our people. Um, but not many of us are there, right? We're not there yet. And I think that what it looks like for that little girl to, to live is that she needs to be able to have a space to just be able to breathe. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And knowing that that breath um, is a foundation of everything, but then hopefully she can build to a place that she can lay down on the grass and wherever she lives and she can dream up visions for what her future is and to know that the world is also hers and that she's Mm -hmm. deserving of everything that this world has to offer. To me, I think that is what true liberation is. And so when we talk about um, existing in spaces and doing art like Pose, um, like Pride Land, um, it's about us being able to not only be seen and heard, but us being able to produce images of ourselves that are empowering, affirming, loving, beautiful, well lit, well costumed, yes. you know, well designed, well curated, beautifully written. All of these things, because all of that gives us building blocks to be able to say, "Oh my God, if if Ricky, if Damon, if Angel and Blanca and Poppy and all of the children of Evangelista and Pose can thrive and be happy um, without ignoring the obstacles that they go through. Maybe I can too. Yeah. And so for me, art from Black women has always been the things that have enabled me to see that, oh, this is where I can go. This is how I can operate in the world. And so for me, I owe so much to so many of those revolutionary Black women who, who came before me. And we all owe so much to them. Can you speak a little bit to the 
role, the vital role that trans women had uh, in in the movement for queer liberation and and and, and black liberation, um, just as a sort of like history lesson for the for the folks in here who don't fucking know, um, <laughs> and, and how important it is that their stories are told on a large scale, so that you know, just tell us why it's important that we mm. we uplift their names. Yeah, you know, for me, you know, one of my favorite chants anytime people are protesting or organizing or on the ground is to hear folks say, whose streets are streets? Whose streets are yes. streets? That is like one of my favorites. And I remember the first time I ever went to um, the Trans Day of Action in New York City, organized by the Audre Lorde Project, I was able to screen that in 2012 with a group, a, a mass, actually, not a group, a mass of black and brown, queer and trans people who've been here, who built, you know, Christopher Street, who built the piers, who made it the legendary thing that it is. And then gentrification came and we were pushed out and yeah. told that those kids don't belong here. We're going to put up video cameras. We're going to put bigger police presence. We're going to make everything pretty. And we want you to get the fuck out, right? And so hearing these young people chant that, these organizers, I, we celebrate pride. It's because of the Stonewall rising, uh, uprisings and riots, which were largely led by street folk, poor folk, folk of color, trans women, gender nonconforming people, butch lesbians, all of us who are the most yeah. vulnerable and were sick of being policed and surveillance and incarcerated because of the way that we expressed ourselves or the way that we expressed our love to whom we express it to. Um, that activism that uprising, that riot, that defending of your life and your ability to be here and to have a safe space and to say that you belong, that's, that's the roots of the work. That's why we celebrate pride every June. It's to that's mark what pride that is. occasion. Yes, and so today when we have these, you know, white gays or people who are, you know, um, subscribing to respectability politics, mm -hmm. they forgot where we came from and Absolutely. why we do what we do today. It's because of those black and brown, queer and trans people who were on the streets who didn't have homes to go to, but right. Stonewall became a haven and a home, right? right? So they were defending that space. They were defending their right to exist um, without fear of policing, harassment, or incarceration. Yeah. And, and so and, we should speak the names, sorry, Marsha P. Johnson. Yes. And Silver Rivera and Stormy and all of them that were there in that collective night um, fighting back. Absolutely. Um, do you think, this moment will bring about real systemic change in the way that in that way that we need it to? I think it will. I do. I think that, you know, we are, you know, 18 countries, you know, all 50 states have, you know, had demonstrations and protests. I think it, it is a, um, uh, the world is on fire. Yeah. Um, and it is lit from our queer, black and trans brilliance. You know, we are on the front lines. We are out there. Remember that, you know, Patrice Colors is a queer Black woman. Yes. Who, um, and so is Alicia Garza, who yes. started Black Lives Matter. That our people have always been here. Bayard Rustin, you yeah. know, James Baldwin, yeah. Audre Lorde, you know, Barbara Smith, all of these yes. folks, Angela Davis, who they, you mentioned before. Yes, Angela Davis, all of, we've been here. We've been doing yeah. this work. And so I think right now with the, you know, I know a lot of people, say that social media isn't da 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 but without social media today, if we were quarantined, we wouldn't know what's going on, right? We wouldn't have seen George Floyd. We wouldn't right. even have heard of Breonna Taylor's story. We wouldn't have known about, you know, Tony McDade and Nina Pop and all of these other black bodies that have constantly been cycled and cycled and cycled as trauma. We are been traumatized by these images and that trauma and that seeing of those images is what has pushed all these people to the streets and ignited this flame that now yeah. has made it impossible for anyone who is not black to not realize that there is an issue and that it's systemic. And that even if you look at the New York Times bestsellers list right now as someone who has my roots in books and being a published author, like seeing that most of the books are about, you know, the anti-racism um, list, books like, you know, um, Stamp from the Beginning, which I'm rereading. It is so yes, brilliant I was and so ask amazing. You to give us some books. That's um, great. Yeah, that's a great one. Some of us are brave, which is an anthology from um, Barbara Smith. is amazing. I uh, from the Kitchen Table Woman of Color Press. I also love this bridge called My Back. Is another one that's amazing. Of course, James Baldwin's Fire Next Time. Yes. Audrey Lord's collecting of, of writings. I also think people should be reading 
as we're talking about abolition work and defunding the police and mass incarceration, we should be reading captive genders as well. Captive yeah. genders centers the prison industrial com com complex with um, um, queer and uh, trans and gender nonconforming people at the root of that work. Okay. Janet, I th thank you so much for doing this. It's so lovely to see your face. I love you so much. And I, I love miss you too, Galan. And I, I, please give Angel my love. I miss you guys so, so much. Uh, it's, it's, it's insane. You don't really realize how good you have it until you don't have it anymore. And so mm. being out of community with, being outside of community with all of you, although we're still in connection to one another, but not being able to actually be with one another uh, really highlights that for me. So I'm, I'm super grateful for you. And um, mm. I hope uh, you continue to be well and sending you lots of love and creativity and uh, fire as, as we fight through this moment, through this movement. Oh, thank you, Delon. And thank you for creating and sharing the space and amplifying it to a whole nother level. You know, the work that you're doing with concentrating on the South, I think is so important because so often when we're talking about queer and trans spaces, we often think about the coasts mm -hmm. and we don't realize that there's so much work and movement work and organizing going on down there that is literally saving lives. And so I thank you for that. And I too can't wait till we're back on set for Pose season three. Yeah. Um, we get to continue to do what I think we do best. So yeah. um, I love you and I appreciate you and I'm sending you all my love. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Love you. Bye, love you too. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, oh my gosh, this has been so great. Uh, thank you to everybody that's tuning in. Uh, thank you, Janet Mock. I think they're gonna shut me off in just a minute. So I'm gonna try to get through my closing remarks. Um, so I just wanna say there is an implicitly selfish nature to our so-called liberation movements. And, and in each one of them, we've, we've seen folks excluded. The civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the queer movement, uh, whether that be LGBTQ folks in the civil rights movement or black and brown and trans women in the feminist movement or black, brown, trans folks in the queer liberation movement. Uh, all of these people that I just talked to have, have, have said the same thing, that we, we have to look outside ourselves and liberation means collective liberation. You know, that reality leads me to believe that perhaps these movements have been created with one purpose, and that's to elevate a small, already privileged group to an even playing field with straight, cis, white men upholding the status quo. These efforts don't fix anything. They instead uphold structural oppression and allow the most privileged within a marginalized group to gain from the oppression of others. Gaining certain freedoms like marriage equality, adoption rights, and equal housing and health care is pivotal, but it isn't enough. Liberation can't just be about gaining individual freedoms. It calls for the dismantling of white supremacy, patriarchy, transphobia, and homophobia. It must be collective liberation. Then and only then will we all have access to justice and freedom. Webster defines queer as differing in some way from what is usual or normal. It is quite clear that we need a new normal. There is a queer future. As Charlene Carruthers asserts, it is in queerness that the world has endless possibilities. And in more ways than one, blackness is inherently queer. So, uh, thank you to Charlene Carruthers uh, for that. That comes from her book, Unapologetic, A Black, Black Queer and Feminist Mandate for Radical Movements. Please check it out. I'm telling you, it is re revolutionary. Um, I want to thank all of my guests from today, uh, Janet Mock, Billy Porter, uh, Alfonso David, Maya Reed. Uh, thank you to Pride Land and PBS, without whom this is not would not be possible. Please check out Pride Land tomorrow to meet some incredible queer folks and allies. PBS, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, thank you to Tiny Horse Productions and John Reynaga, who made this possible too. And to my team of superheroes, Chelsea and Mitch, I love you guys so much. Shout out to Joey Harris Inc. Uh, the, to the LGBTQ Task Force, um, HRC, uh, my friend Darnell Moore, thank you for your brotherhood and, and being the, the, the great brother that you are and counselor to me in so many different ways. Um, and, and 
thank all of you for for watching today. I appreciate you, and uh, you know I, this has been really incredible. Um, I, we're gonna do it again next Thursday with a whole different lineup of folks, um, and uh, I'll see you then. Sending, but until then, I'm sending you lots of love, and I wish I could get my music to play. This was the song I was dedicating to Janet, Young Gifted and Black by Aretha Franklin. This is to Janet Mock. Yes, Young Gifted and Black. Y'all, I'm rooting for everybody black. I'm rooting for everybody, but I'm rooting for everybody black. That's what we talk about today. Sue me. It is what it is. Hey.